And welcome, welcome. Active Campaign Live, episode three. I don't even count the episodes anymore. Uh, I'm just happy to be live. Ernie, how you doing? Say hello I'm, to your host, Ernie. He hello. Hello, everyone. I feel the exact same. Jason, love this, uh, the, the on-air sign that you have uh, behind you. That is fantastic. I've been upgrading. There's a few things missing. Uh, you know, Brexit happened here. Uh, we're in lockdown. And so uh, I have some camera gear that I have a new lens that didn't show up. It's stuck at the border. There's all kinds of chaos. Uh, but I'll tell you, you know, what did show up, funny enough, is my 1986 replica Cinderella T-shirt uh, from yeah, my childhood. Go. So good to know. Glad to know that we have our shipping priorities uh, in order. This thing showed up in three days. I got five or six other things that have been uh, stuck at the border for quite some time, but they'll make it here. Um, but yeah, other than that, everything's going well. I'm, I'm really excited about uh, the episode today because we have our first guest on. Uh, and this is all about sonic branding and audio identity. Uh, so uh, lots of cool stuff happening today. I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, we're going to bring them on. We're going to do something a little bit different today. Usually we do our, our we have a, a cool things of the week segment, and then we go into book of the week segment, and then we bring on the guest and we do a chat. Well, today uh, it's a unique format because we're going to bring our special guest on, and uh, he's going to do these segments with us. He's going to play along with us, uh, and I heard he might even treat us to a little music, a little live music, which... I think we need to call Guinness because this could be the first ever marketing show with a live music performance. It's got to be. I'm just excited at the prospect of live music. It has been it has been so, so long, too long. I am desperate for it. So I'm very, very excited to have our guest with us today. March 14th, Morrissey at the O2 or the uh, uh, SSE Arena, Wembley was the last show I saw. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite devastated. But uh, uh, Ernie, what about you? What's the last show you saw? Oh, Morrissey's a good one. I don't think I can compete with that. And honestly, I think the last like live music experience I had was I actually did go to one show. I went to a parking lot show um, at the the parking lot of the Chicago Fire Stadium in Bridgeview, Illinois. And that was uh, Umphreys McGee. And it was a very interesting time watching a show from a from a parking spot next to your car and unable to be in a crowd. But, you know, it was live music. That that sounds like a horrible experience. I'm sorry. It was a learning experience. Club. You know, I like the clubs, but uh, anyway. Um, so, hey, without further ado, uh, let's bring on our featured guest of the week. <music> Julian Villard, singer, songwriter extraordinaire. Welcome to the program. How are you doing today? I, th I see you just abbreviated JB. I, lo I love it. I know. I keep keep it easy. Hey, Jason. Hey, Ernie. How you guys doing? Um, good to see you across the internet. Um, Welcome to the program. I, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to do things a little bit differently today. We're going to bring you in for the in the entire show segments and everything. Uh, we want you to play along with us. Are you good with that? Yeah. How, how's that? Uh, and you're sure. come calling in from uh, my hometown of St. Louis, Missouri. I'm calling in from your hometown of St. Louis from a basement. How's that? Not your hometown, though. Not my hometown, very much. I mean, I barely live here. I live in a house. I live in a house. I don't leave the house. Got it. All that. right. Well, um, uh, way, to, way to make a splash, Julian. <laughs> Let's jump yeah, into uh, our, 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 our favorite segment of the week. Julian, you're welcome to play along with this. This one, it's, you know what time it is, Ernie. It's time for Cool Things. <laughs> Gotta love the new segments. I gotta shorten those up. Uh, it's the first time I've used these folks, so uh, be be kind, be kind. And I can't see the comments right now when I'm when I'm producing as well. So I will tell you this: the um, the coolest thing I've seen this week, Ernie. Since we are on the audio theme, we're going to talk about the importance of uh, sonic branding and audio identity. I think this is really key with the explosion of Clubhouse, which just got valued at like a hundred billion dollars or whatever. But um, I found two things I love this week. Um, let me see if I can share this first thing with you here it goes to uh da, 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 da. thank you julian for the smooth jazz sound. this is this is absolutely fantastic yeah i like it it's very calming all right so uh my first cool thing of the week i gotta get up to um lenovo who uh they <laughs> this is quite crazy so what they did is um I think it was the uh, uh, theverge.com, which was the site we're on right now. They actually did a review for the Lenovo Legion 5i gaming laptop, uh, and they they gave it a seven out of ten. But then uh, Lenovo found this agency and they hired a, a Swedish 
death metal band. This is an actual metal band called Iron Savages to um, to sing the review back. Julian, I'm going to pause your live jazz for some obnoxious metal here for a second. But just listen to what, what Lenovo did with this. And this is a real band. This is a real commercial. Uh, the lyrics The lyrics get me every time. Hopefully this works. Oh, and I don't think... Can we hear the uh, audio? I've got no audio on my end, but I can see the subtitles. <laughs> you get the idea, right? Anyway, so check it out. Check out the video. It's a little bit obnoxious, but um, I thought it was pretty, uh, pretty clever, pretty ingenious, if you will. Um, where is the... Now, uh, the other cool thing I found, since we're, uh, again, on the topic of audio identity, this is interesting. Julian, I think you're going to like this one. Octopus Energy, which I'm a huge fan of, their marketing team, they do so many cool things. They, uh, they do something really cool, customer experience, uh, taking it to another level, if you will, with their, uh, their hold music. And so if you can see this here, when, what they do is based on their database, based on, on what they know about you, uh, in your year of birth, they ask you, or they automatically play the number one hit that was uh, number one on the charts when you were 14 years old. And it's called your Octopus Jam. So just a, an interesting level of customer experience to take into another level. Uh, Octopus Energy is uh, changing the game. Uh, Julian, you care to share your year yes. of birth, or, or should we just make one up? Uh, no, I can tell you. I'm 1979. 79 let's see uh let's see how accurate the uh, octopus jam is this one uh, according to oh. octopus jam your octopus jam is i would do anything for love but i won't do that by meat love uh, i'm all in on that one yeah ernie ernie what do you got uh 1993 1993 ernie, you are a child ernie you can are you really born in 19 jesus 1993 <laughs> what's going on here what world are we living in <laughs> bleeding you, love by leona song. lewis yeah, it's not exactly what I was listening to when I was 14, um, but it's a jam. I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take uh, it as whole music for sure. And we'll see what when my I jam lived in, is here. Go ahead, Julie. When I lived in London, Jason, I, that was the number one song, Bleed in Love. Was it? Um, yeah. Leona Lewis, One Hit Wonder. All right, um, Ernie, what do you got uh, for your uh, cool thing of the week? My cool thing of the week here is this uh, this smart guitar amp that I found. Uh, I will drop the link here in comments if that works. Uh, it's called the Spark, and it solves for a lot of practice issues that uh, musicians are having, especially in this period of time where we're not able to, you know, leave our houses and everyone is at home. And if you're in an apartment and you're trying to practice your electric guitar, you want to turn it up loud, but you really can't. Uh, this amp solves a ton of problems for you. Um, and one of the coolest features that I saw on here was that you can actually queue up any YouTube video, any Spotify song, and the AI technology within the amp will analyze the song and then give you the charts for it. So no more, you know, searching guitar tab websites, trying to find the charts online, you know, learning it in a different key or watching some guy in a YouTube video play it. You could actually just analyze the studio version of the track and you can play right there along with it. So um, it, it apparently it came out last year, but I was not aware of it until this week. And uh, I thought it was super cool. Ah, very cool. Uh, can do we have can everyone hear us OK? I think I'm, so. I'm, I'm looking I think at the they're... comments here, and I think it sounds like we're okay. You know what? Just blow up the comments if uh, if you can't hear us. Okay, this is live. Anything can happen live. I love that. Anything can happen. Who knows what's going to happen? Um, Julian, anything cool you've seen this week? Oh, you haven't left the house. Sorry. I haven't left the house. I've been on the phone a bunch. Uh, I'll try to. I, I'm trying to think if I've seen any really cool like so sonic or audio uh, related uh, things that have roped me in. I'm just still blown away by that. Like uh, the whatever the the great um, t-shirt. Like you know the most like the the the, the, the worst t-shirts in the world. They somehow are able to find me on Facebook. You know, like they know that I'm susceptible to like t-shirts with dumb things on them, and they just seem to find me. So I'm still in amazement of that technique. I feel like you guys have something to do with that. No, oh, no, no, no. Uh, all about relevance for us. So um, let's, uh, you know, let's let's just jump right into uh, our, our main guest here. Julian, I'm, 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 I got to tell you, uh, I'm sort of I'm kind of a super fan. People know me as a metal guy, but I'm kind of a super fan. I just want to show you something. Um, my Julian Ballard collection here, by the way. Um, oh, my LP. God. 
Look at that. Signed. Oh, yeah. Personally, that's, personally that's signed. That's a collector's item. That's a collect. Uh, There's not a lot of those. I'm telling you right now. And CDs. Like, like I am a super. I'm a. I'm a Julian Villard super fan. I've seen you live before. I brought the when um the LinkedIn team when I worked at LinkedIn. I brought my team to see you, um, singing in uh in New York. And actually, I think I attempted a song with you. It was uh that was pretty awful. But oh my god, I remember that. Yeah, because because I uh you know in the before times I used to work at a uh, live piano karaoke bar, and uh, you came with your crew, and uh, you 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 uh you engaged, which means you made a fool of yourself, which is what exactly you're <laughs> supposed to do at a at a piano karaoke bar. That's the correct behavior. I underestimated the 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 range of the great uh, Hall right. Notes is what I did. I remember that um, you you picked a song that was way too high for you, and and but you went for it. You didn't you didn't that was what's important. You you, you the moment you you possessed the courage to go for it, and you you may not have hit the note, but you tried. <laughs> Julian, I I think I don't want my intro to sell you short. I know you've uh, accomplished quite a bit in your career, uh, major label success, touring the world, uh, Howard Stern show, which we're going to talk a little bit about, but. Uh, um, what's been like, what's your favorite moment from, uh, how long have you been doing this first of all? And, and what's been the highlight for you? So I have been making, I mean, I, I started writing songs in my teens. Um, and I, uh, went to a performing arts high school in New York and then I went to college and I majored in music. So I had a very kind of traditional path. And basically I started right when I got out of school, trying to create a music career for myself while, um, teaching uh, physical education. I was a phys ed teacher for, for kindergartners. I did elementary school phys, phys ed for the first uh, four years of when I was out of school. So I was doing that while trying to create um, kind of a music career. And my first real quote unquote break or the thing that basically let me quit um, teaching gym and, and really technically it was quit uh, being on unemployment because I think at that point I'd been let go of the gym teaching job uh, was um, I, signed a major label deal off of a, a website called MySpace, which uh, you wow. may have heard of. Ernie, Indeed there was a, we have. I don't know if you were born. Were you born when MySpace was around? It was a HTML-based uh, yeah. website. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. I'm just I'm joking, totally joking. That's fair. How many albums yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, do you have? How, how many albums are in the, uh, the Julian Villard catalog these days? Uh, six albums. Six exactly. albums that uh, so many people have heard. Uh, no, I've, I've been basically putting out records since 2003. So 17, 18 years now. I mean, um, you know, a bunch of EPs. And basically, you know, I was, I had the whole kind of typical major label experience where you get signed and they pump a lot of money into you and then you release a song and then you get dropped. You know, that's like kind of the standard, uh, um, the standard uh, merry-go-round ride. But, but basically in the decade after that, um, decade plus, I kind of used a lot of the connections I'd made, but also sort of the skills that I was developing and developed to try and spread in a much more scattergun wide approach. And I think my the sort of secret to my success, and I'm not even gonna call it to success, but I feel like if you're a musician and you make a living at music, that is successful by any stretch. I basically just say yes all the time. When someone asks me if I can do something, I just say, yes, I can do that. And then I figure out how to do it once I've said yes. <laughs> so the, the topic of the show today is, is uh, audio branding, sonic identity. Um, and I think this is important because you've written some songs for some pretty big, uh, big, pretty big brands. Um, one in particular, uh, Ernie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal your, your question here that, uh, uh, because it's close to home. But the Aldi song, this is a big deal, right? This is. Uh, can you talk about um, how this came about? And and this is this was the audio identity. I kind of borrowed that from the video. There's like a whole behind the scenes making oh, of, yeah. uh, which is it's, it's really well done. But they made a huge deal about this. Uh, can you talk about uh, that experience? What was I mean? How did they even find you? Uh, and then you know how did you approach writing a song or writing that uh, that 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 thing that people hear and associate with the brand? Right. So the brand you're in question, which I don't think you mentioned, is that I, I presently, uh, you would uh, not necessarily know this, but the audio imaging for Aldi supermarkets in the UK only. It has only been uh, distributed in the UK. They're still still waiting for the, uh, the clearance payment for when they go international. That'll be a nice day. I won't have to do webcasts with you guys then. I'll just be sitting on my gold throne in St. Louis in a basement. Um, the, uh, basically, I... Uh, wrote uh, a song that was sort of extrapolated and, and, and turned into mnemonics and all kinds of things. And really in the, in the, in the ad, you'll, you'd recognize it. They sponsored the Great British Bake Off. It's just everywhere in England right now. But 
the ad is a lot of the instrumental music and the mnemonic, which if you guys know or don't know what it is, that's uh, it's essentially the melody that you would associate with the brand. Like, you know, the, the most obvious one being I'm loving it for McDonald's or uh, I mean, there's a million. Of, sometimes the mnemonics are just um, is it Intel inside? That's the bum, 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 bum. Like they're, they're just little licks and little things that because of the way they're, they're couched in the content, it, it just becomes synonymous with the identity of the brand. So I got lucky with this thing that the lyric, and it's actually a song, is um, every day amazing. But you probably have just heard it on some weird thing that flew by on radio as ding, 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 ding. You wouldn't, you, it's not even that recognizable. If the thing runs for another decade, everyone will know it. <laughs> um, and when it comes to getting paid, that is the thing. If you can get the mnemonic for the audio branding, like that's the, that's the dream, you know, that's like the, oh my God, I hit a home run because that will be kept for years, you know, until they completely reformat the campaign because the investment that the brand will make into making that sound and that melody synonymous with their image is, is pretty massive. And as a writer, it's really substantial. Um, so uh, th I wrote this, basically it, it was an ad agency uh, named uh, Adelphoi, which then became DLMDD that essentially contracted me or subcontracted me for it. And I, bas I pitched on it and won the pitch, you know? It was like, they were like, we think you'd be good for this. We kind of think your vibe fits this. Can you do a version of Mr. Blue Sky? And I was like, yeah, no problem, I got that. And I wrote this song and, and the lyric again was something that I kind of threw off, but. You know, it's, it's, you're always threading the needle when you're writing a lyric for a brand because it's like, it's the one thing that executives think that they can do, but they can't. So you have to sort of take their ideas, which have been completely crowdsourced and, you know, like, which are gobbledygook and sort of make it into a phrase that is a song. Um, and, it, they, you know, they love the lyric and they were ready to go. And then the sort of irony of it is that, you know, the deal basically was executed about a month before the pandemic started and the lyric it's a grocery store and the lyric is every day amazing so they made like a judgment call be like you know what maybe every day is not amazing right now so we're just going to use the instrumental and i'm like that's fine with me that's totally cool <laughs> <laughs> so there is a song called every day amazing that i wrote that they're never going to use probably unless you know until down the road but it's it's you know and it's so very much the espousing the aldi I don't even know if you want to call it aesthetic, but mission statement. And that's definitely was, you know, that's always a tricky thing. So yeah, so I got tapped for songwriting and it ended up becoming really like an instrumental. Excellent. Ernie, I think you had a couple of questions. What do you got? Yeah, I, you brought up a lot of like really interesting things. And obviously uh, Jason and I love music and, and I've played around with writing some songs. So this whole idea of, uh, you know, the melody line and then the lyrics that go along with that melody line um, with, all the, you know, deciding to go with, with just the melody line. I'm kind of curious as to how you arrive at that. Do you, do you kind of present uh, a few different melody lines um, or do you come up with one and then if it gets stuck in your own head, is that a good sign? Like, how does that work? Well, in, are you talking about in terms of when it comes to the creation of the process or selling it to the brand? Because um, they're two different things. Well, maybe both. What are, what are the differences there? Because, you know, when you're writing music for advertising, it's, it's always this really strange balance where usually the thing that you think, that it's, it's, it's essentially like, it really is like playing the lottery and it's a volume game, right? You want to write as many of them as possible. And so in a way, sometimes when you try to think about the crafting of the melody for something like it, you're sort of fighting against yourself, right? Because ultimately what you're doing when you make something for brand, and it's not necessarily even just a brand like, um, uh, you know, like something like a supermarket. It could be for the Howard Stern show. It could be for NPR. It could be for any of the others or even something I've stuff I've done for like when I've done courses for LinkedIn learning the the content's primary goal is to serve the needs of the brand. So melody choices, lyric choices, harmony choices, groove, tempo, those are all subject to that one override overriding thesis. So to sit there and kind of deconstruct the melody into something that you're artistically happy with is counterproductive. You basically just kind of want to get it done. You know, that's really the main thing. And a lot of times that if you sort of synthesize the energy and the feeling of what they're going for, or you're able to read between the lines, sometimes the simplest, best choice that your mind unconsciously makes 
is the one they get excited with because ultimately it's a sales gig, right? It's not artistic. You're not trying to create a melody that's going to, you're not doing yesterday. Right. right. It's not that. You're creating a piece of content that the brand can identify with and then they can push through there. And they have, they have so many needs. You know, it's almost like because they've got so many conditions, you kind of can't do anything too crazy. So in a lot of ways, your simplest, dumbest choice is probably your best choice. And that means the thing you thought about the least. Hmm. Julian, we got a question. Uh, do, you have the, uh, do you have the rights to these jingles or, or does, that, uh, does that go to the brand? Um, Quercus, uh, if I can say your name right, that's a great name. Um, I, so it's, typically when you do one of these deals, the terms are set outright. So basically when you pitch, you're entering into the contract. So if they pick it up, that's the terms. Um, and that varies, you know, because it's not, you know, you've got, in this case, you had Aldi who had hired McCann and then McCann had hired the Jingle House and the Jingle House had hired me. So there's four layers in the cake of rights of who's getting pieces of what. Usually for the, the jingle company, for, for McCann, I don't re actually really know, but I would imagine they don't really have IP. But something like a jingle company, they're, they're usually partnering with you. And in a lot of instances, they're publishing the song, right? Uh, in other instances, they're actually taking some of the writer percentage sometimes. It gets that aggressive, you know? So wow. in, that, in that instance, you, that said, you are well compensated if you win. Like it's the kind of thing where typically if it's the big enough gig like that, um, you can, you know, you're like, yes, take the rights. I don't care. But as the, as the business has transitioned, you know, there's less and less, a lot of times, a lot of the royalties actually for the stuff, especially in America, they come from performance. They don't come from writing. And as stuff has become less and less, you know, they're, they're circumventing unions and all these things. There's all kinds of, you know, the, the pot gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Plus it's, you know, like I've, I booked a huge Super Bowl thing for Wix and I remember it was just a straight buyout because it was just internet only. And it was a continuation of their Super Bowl ad that just with Gal Gadot and Jason Statham, like part one was broadcast and then parts two through eight were on the web and I was on two through eight, which was sort of like, you know, sort of a continuation. It's just, it's, that's why really the name of the game when you get into it, it's volume. And the best way to get connected with one of those volumes is to be in some sort of lane where you're working with kind of jingle houses or you know if you get lucky sometimes you, you land the client directly now uh julian did write a song for active campaign uh which That's i right. i, I it, it, it's Go a figure. top hit in my mind julian i think you might have i think you might have uh, missed your chance here See, when you when you I'm delivered a, this one <laughs> i'm going to teach you right now that one of the keys to um audio branding the client is always right jason it is a pop hit it's a, it's huge it's worldwide smash Number one song, top of the charts. It's, that's, it's that's a catchy number. number. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to play it today, but uh, I, we might okay. we might leak it out. Um, we might uh, uh, leak it out at the end of the show uh, in the comments section. But we're getting ready to debut this with some big announcements coming up. But uh, so stay tuned for that. But uh, I listened to it. It's remarkable. I played it for a few people. You got quite a buzz going on the internal uh, active yes. campaign crew. Uh, I there were some people dancing. You know, my wife Trish, she's also a fan. She's like, damn, this is really good. <laughs> So I'm excited about that, and it's going to be sort of um, themed to part of our content. I've always been a fan of, of like like writing jingles and um, and totally. putting that that like fun audio angle onto uh, onto our content. Um, Julian, I, you spent some time writing uh, on the Howard Stern show when you were in New York. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what it was like writing songs with uh, or for Howard? Yeah, you know, I still I still do that gig. Um, basically, I uh, I. I do it remotely now. Essentially, like that's a perfect that's a perfect example where like so the whole gig there was they would bring me in during the show, and I would play the wrap up show, which is the show they have that happens after Howard. Excuse me, and um, basically, I would have to write three songs in the time span from when the show started to when the show ended about whatever he talked about. <laughs> so I have four hours improv songwriting. Wow, on the spot. It's not improv. So it'd be one thing if it was improv, but these are actually composed pieces. So it's, in a way, it's almost harder because, you know, improv, you always have the sort of one wow factor of, hey, I'm just doing this and the audience has that information. This is like, I wrote a song, here it is, it rhymes. It's a full 90 second song about whatever Howard Stern said this morning. So that's a perfect example. If you stop to think about what you're doing there, you're done. 
Like you literally have no time to think. You just have to go and make the connections and see it. And what's funny is usually two of them suck. They're not very good. They're like, they're, they're like low, but one will be actually pretty good. And it's usually because I arrived at something where I just made the simplest, quickest connection I could possibly make in my mind and didn't question it because there was no time to analyze it. Um, but that, and I think a lot of any kind of roadblocks that I used to have, that gig, I did that pretty hardcore. Like maybe I would come in six times a year for about three or four years. Like, it, it forced me, you know, in that, on that platform, I mean, you have millions of people listening to this thing that I had to just basically get over whatever reservations I had about my artistry or anything. And just, I had to make it, you know, I'd literally make it work, you know, just like I had to duct tape the song together and figure out a way. And it's also was really interesting because you have, there you have a fan base with a huge history, right? That people have been listening to that show for 40 years. And so part of my role is that I'm doing a function of of continuing that narrative. So there's all these plot points that I have to keep track of with the producer who slept with this guy's girlfriend who did this. And the more that I can infuse the knowledge of the show, the, and it's like you're talking in code almost to the fan base, like to people who don't follow the show, it makes no sense. But, to, but if you can find sort of the interior jokes, um, it's like people, they, they love it because it's, it's speaking their language. And that's very, it's, it's the same philosophy as I would do with a brand or anything else. It's just incredibly micro and incredibly targeted. What you know, you, you you talk about, and and a lot of your songs are are just stories, right? So, uh, um, half done. Uh, no one's getting married tonight. My my personal favorite, uh, which is uh, an incredible video too, an example of um, oh, thank you, just a fun story. But I, I, you know, I wonder, and you've had you've had some marketing experiences yourself as well as agencies and whatnot. Uh, are we overcomplicating storytelling? It seems like. Everyone is a storyteller. Everybody wants to tell better stories, up level their storytelling. But it seems like uh, no one's really doing it well. Do you think we discovered how difficult it is to tell stories in with short, shorter attention spans or in smaller doses? And and what lessons could you give to marketers about telling a story, a compelling story, in a uh, in a short time frame? Well, it's really complex, right? And I do, I do think that being, it's a very difficult position to be in when you're trying to sell something, right? I, I'm, I'm usually in the business of selling myself. So in a way, that's very empowering, but it's very limiting, right? Um, when it comes to me trying to, you know, take what I do and move it to sell a product or to sell a thing, it, it's, it's, it's to find the voice is very tricky. And, you know, you're dealing with a much better, bigger plane, right? And that's the problem is that how do you, how do you tell a personal story? How do you tell, how do you get one-to-one -one with somebody when really you're moving this giant aircraft carrier? And I think that's a really tough thing. And it's something that pop music suffers from as well. You know, when people, people see a Lady Gaga record or they see uh, a Dua Lipa record and what's represented there is the work and skill sets of hundreds of people behind it of hundreds of microscopic decisions that have been made down to the color that she's wearing during this photo shoot, to the sound of the snare drum here, to which song got released first, to which, you know, the way the logo is set up. All, it's like those artists that are presented as um, their, their, their products. And, and, and I think the difficulty is when you're a marketer, like you're not, you know, you could, we could, Dua Lipa looks like a person, but she's a product. I mean, she is a person, but the, the album and the, the thing that they're selling, the narrative, is, is a product. And I think, how can you do that with detergent? How can you do that with whatever? Automated marketing. You know, like these are difficult things to tackle and to humanize. So I don't think they're making it too complex, but I do think like there's, there comes a point when you have to sort of make a choice and I think humans respond to that you know it's something about when when you when you make something direct and like you kind of try to cut through people it, it becomes personal to them and they fill in the blanks and I do think sometimes within in the world of marketing like we let our um we let some of the ideas and the desire and the the goals get in the way of the subconscious I mean, I, I, the way I personally approach it is you try to get, get the content out and then once it's out and you're happy with it, then you can shape it and edit it to nobody, to everyone's business. And I think that's always a tough thing to, and that's a space as an artist that I've learned to protect and cultivate. So when I go into those situations, there's always a point when people are 
you know, I'm having conversations with a client. I'm just like, leave it with me, you know, <laughs> which is basically like, leave me alone. I I'll give you what you want, or I'll give you something at least to bounce off of. And then we can get to what you want. Julian, I'm, I'm wondering if you could uh, uh, grace us with, uh, with a, a song, one of your favorite songs, maybe one of your favorite stories. Uh, I know you, um, you had a very ambitious project where you actually created a musical last year and yes. launched it over uh over kickstarter i believe or, or one of the uh crowdfunding projects platforms but yeah you got you got an example for the audience here can you give sure. us uh, a dose of how, uh julian villard live how how uh what's the rating of this show what are we uh right now? Are P we a G, pg a PG, pg we're pg, PG. okay so i will not i'm not going to sing my song i can't believe you're pregnant parentheses again we're going to leave that one out um well, let me think of a good storytelling song for you guys from the new record that's fun, uh, that I can still play because Lord knows I've been, um, well, what? I'll play, um, I'll play No One's Getting Married Tonight because I know you love that song and that's a good oh, example this, of, um, one of the finest pop examples. songs I've ever heard. Um, so it's sort of some like context with this song. And again, the question is if, I don't know if this sort of, um, makes it a pop tune, but, um, there's basically this, this song is about uh, the moment when my wife was sort of pressuring me, <laughs> asking me, hinting very uh, directly about um, the idea of us getting married. And I was just like, can't we hang around and um, just sort of be, um, be friends and figure it out? And the answer was very much no. <laughs> so I sort of wrote the song as kind of an answer to that dilemma. And she never thought the song was funny. Now she thinks it's funny and cute. But let me tell you, when I, we were not married when I played the song for her and she was not happy about it. Let's get a little reverb going. Baby, look at the sky. I can see the bridge from here. Our future's never been so clear. The clock is counting the reasons why. You should leave me on the brink with a lifetime left to think about the city and all its people walking around parks till the day they die. Oh, don't make me one of them. I guarantee I'll give this love a try. Here's what I think. Let's go and get drunk without my friends. Make sure the evening ends with bacon out in the back of every cab. I don't care where we wake up If you swear you stay with me And no one's getting married tonight No girl in this bar looks better than you No matter what they do they can say Let's have a three-way We know the only two things that are true Is that you're leaving with me And no one's getting married tonight I have a plan if we wait a couple years and develop our careers, this could be more than a flash in the pan. Flip a good thing into great, maybe own some real estate inside the city. So full of people riding subways till the day they die. Don't make me one of them. I guarantee I'll give this love a try. Here's what I think, let's go and get drunk without my friends Make sure the evening ends, we'll get laid in a white limousine We'll listen to Springsteen, I will spend all my Sundays with you If no one's getting married tonight No guy in this club looks better than me No matter who you see, he could be a shirtless fireman We know he's only muscles and a tan And that you're leaving with me yeah, no one's getting married tonight. Hi, hi. Whoa, Whoa, Lord, oh, tonight. Yeah, not tonight. Here's what I think. Let's go and get drunk. I'm your friend, and I want my life to end. With no compromises, let's be ourselves and get rid of all disguises. I'm scared of the unknown and you're scared of being alone in theirs. Nothing wrong with their men and never fear. They get stronger every year. Nobody's getting any younger, I can see. 
Ah, future is shining so bright. Maybe the timing's not right. Do you want anything white? Maybe I'm not the one. Let's get married tonight. Hi, hi. Whoa, up, Whoa, Lord, Lord, oh, tonight. Not tonight. We're all clapping. There's applause. The comments are blowing up with applause, with virtual oh applause. Bun Julian. Bun Bunch of wrong chords. We'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. Bunch of wrong chords and, you know, I, distort, whatever. What, I mean, I love that song. And the video is even better. And the video is funny because you literally shot this at your wedding. One take. Is it one take? No. So what we did, what, I, I had my buddy Jim Glaub, who's, a, who's actually an incredible marketing person. He, he uh, does a ton of stuff for Broadway shows. We, when we did this without telling my wife. Um, we, he set up a fake video booth at the wedding where people would come in and sing the song and he's like, give them the lyrics and he's just like, let's run it a couple times and he would just do whatever they want. And it was like a fake video booth. Everybody thought they were making like a wedding video. I mean, they didn't really realize they were making a music video of the wedding. So he has like everyone on there, the mother-in-law and it's, it's legit. And my wife has no idea what's going on. And then basically when it was all done, he edited it all together to look like they were all singing the song, you know, even though they probably was like, I think he'd even done it more like the, he'd like basically given found all these slots and he was just playing lip loops of the song over and over again and making people just kind of say these three lyrics great and then like sending them off on their way wasted no one's getting married tonight that is the song uh just a quick search to show up the video uh it's charming it's brilliant it's funny uh Jill, what about that setup man like i'm, I'm working on my streaming game yeah, that was incredible i, saw, I thought I thought you were like, because you went to the big screen. I was like, oh, I might as well whip out the guns here. Although it did, it did cause me to play some wrong notes. I'm still getting my hands around it. Um, yeah, I basically, because I've been doing so much live streaming, uh, I, I kind of went a little super nerd and uh, created a whole bonkers five cam rig here for myself. Five cameras? Uh, you know, wow. It's five cameras. Can, and I switched them with can, my feet. Can you scroll through them for us? Yeah, can we take can a tour? Us? Sure. Yeah. Um, here, go, go make me big because it's more impressive when I take up the whole screen and you'll see it all. Um, so this is uh, camera one. This is my like, you know, nice look here. And then I've got, uh, oops, I'm on the wrong thing here. See, I'm not even doing it right. This is camera two, right? So it's this one. I never know which one is which. Uh, camera three, right, which is here. Uh, there's camera four, which I did not activate during that, which is the behind the scenes camera where you can like wow. see what's going on. Wow, oh, like, that's hey, cool. And then, uh, yeah, I think it's, I should angle it differently. And then uh, we've got the crazy, which is literally a webcam, just taped, gaff taped to my ceiling. Which is the piano <laughs> cam. That's all that is. And, uh, and yeah, that's the whole, uh, that's the rig. Very cool. Ernie, that's, that's impressive, huh? Yes, that's uh, giving me something to aspire to here. It's, I've, I, I've, know, got, I've got... You, Look okay. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say. I'm not gonna say. Go ahead, because that's now we're on, that, that means we're on Zoom. Then, but go ahead. <laughs> Listen, we're gonna see people and just work on an audio delay now, which is actually probably gonna go very well for debate and conversation. We're gonna let people finish their sentences, and then the next. Okay, now you speak. Um, the uh, yeah, actually, I played. Um, you know, sort of, kind of, thanks to you, Jason, and and some of the getting more familiar with the company. I got hired to do your holiday party, and um, I had all these like really intense issues with my, and I just got so frustrated. I was like, you know what, we're gonna, and I spent a month going absolutely insane in this basement, trying to figure out all the nerdy stuff about it. What about the robe? The robe is here, actually. And if there's any active campaign employees, I will. The robe is up on my eBay right now. It's the, <laughs> not starting, funny. Bid, the starting bid is two twenty-five. <laughs> not, not funny, uh, Julian. So, not. what what advice do you have for marketers who are looking into uh, audio branding or um, thinking about uh, maybe a jingle, maybe a, a song, a full song, uh, maybe just some sound effects? Like, uh, what's your advice for them to get get started, and uh, and how can they uh, find you? You know, I think we're, one of the cool things is that we're sort of living in this age, you know, which can be frustrating for people like me, but there's so many resources for library music at this point. I mean, there's just so much free music. And even it's at the point for creators where there's things like Splice, where p literally it's, it's royalty free 
sounds. Like you can get drum, you can build a complete song in a DAW, you know, in Logic or GarageBand or whatever with just sounds you found. So I think you need to do as much as you can yourself, right? And go through that crucible of fire. Um, and then when you're ready for it, AKA when you've got the budget for it, right? To go and find a person like me or, you know, other people. I mean, there's people who, you know, do this, do it even more business than I do in our huge companies who are willing to work with you and help you realize your vision. You know, it's like, it's the same thing I would say to a, a marketer dealing with graphic design. You know, there's all these tools out there now. There's Canva, there's like, you know, there, there's there are ways for you to create things kind of on your own. And I think it's worth putting the time in because the, um, it, it's, it's almost like it serves a twofold purpose. It's, you can make things cheaper and quicker and you can also learn how hard it is to actually make something. So therefore, when you get to a professional who you're paying, you're like, you know what, there's a reason why I'm hiring this person. And because I realize I just, I have all my, I have limitations here and allow them to help, you know, cause if you, if you hire the right person, they're going to basically let you sculpt it with them. You know, that's essentially how it's supposed to work. It's not. And I think any person who works in a, as, in a service way with audio or with visuals, they understand that, you know, it's like they, they understand how to, because it's your vision they're trying to execute. If they're not doing that, then they're not the right person. But I think spending the time to learn the software as best you can your own is one of the best pieces of advice I can give to anybody, even if it's incredibly frustrating, just to learn how frustrating it is. You know, it, it's interesting because I think once you start, once you go down that rabbit hole just a little bit, you start playing with audio sounds and seeing how it can sort of uh, enhance your marketing efforts, no matter what it might be or, or pretty much anything. Totally. Uh, I mean, Ernie, um, there's like several musicians at uh, Active Campaign, and uh, Ernie just launched a new show called Automate That. Congrats on that launch, by the way. Uh, Thank you. And uh, he wrote a song. Who wrote that song, by the way? I, the I wrote. I wrote that song. He wrote yeah, the you song. Got it, Ernie, you got it. And he sent me over the link, and he uh, asked me to, to lay down some bass jams to it. And I had to go find my iRig, and <laughs> it took me. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna lie, Ernie. I spent probably two and a half hours looking for my iRig because I knew it was buried somewhere from the move. Hooked it up. I'm like, man, this is a really cool little jam. And then now I'm hooked. And now I'm all about audio. I'm looking like, like, how can I enhance this or how can I do this? And and then Clubhouse is blowing up with, uh, you know, the audio, um, uh, audio rooms. I mean, more spoken word, but but still, there's there's. <laughs> we well, it's, we it's, probably should explore this much more as marketers. It, it's such a huge tool because you have to think about the way music works. It attaches. I mean, you know. Okay, so there's like people who make, you know, there's like the music for music's sake. But for most people, music attaches, attaches itself to imagery, to memory, right? Songs remind people of a time in their life. It's, and the connection is overwhelming. It's like it's, it's complete sensory involvement. And it's a way for a marketer or anything to make your product or your message tactile. It's, it's essentially, it's a bridge that you're building to your, your, your buyer or your listener or whoever it is. And... That's incredibly powerful. That's why, you know, I'm able to go and create a Patreon and have, you know, a ton of subscribers because they, like the connection to me through my songs is, it's what's gotten me here, you know, it's, and it's, and, I, and that's a tool. Now, granted, like, you know, you have to figure it out, it's got to be good, all that stuff, you got to take the time to do it, but the potential is huge and it gives people this sort of, you know, I, I, when this, when the pandemic happened with all of the horrible things that it brought, one of the huge opportunities is that I think as a marketer and as someone who sat like this, the door kind of, the, the, the matrix got shaken up a little bit. And now there's little cracks for you to, to crawl through. And like, this is a time when you should be spending trying to learn these programs. Just get it, get it in, even just for your own education, even if you're never going to use them again. Um, because the, the audio stuff, it's really, I think it's overlooked how powerful it is, you know, how much of a connection it makes to the viewer or the listener or the, the consumer or whatever, however, whoever you're trying to speak to. Yeah, that's a great point there about just like the salience of, of, you know, branding when it comes to audio. Like you mentioned, you know, you hear a song and it reminds you of a person or it reminds you of a place or a certain event in your life. Um, and then that, you know, it just it creates that distinct memory in your head. So if you can, you know, replicate that for a brand, it just makes makes the entire experience that much more salient and available, you know, in the in the minds of your your customers, your audience, your potential customers, whoever the whoever the audience is. 
Yeah, it's a terribly think, underutilized yeah. strategy. I will tell you that. Julian, you talked a little bit about, I know we're running over, but uh, I, I got a few more questions for you here. Why have you? Is that okay? okay? Can we keep it for a few more minutes? Maybe, yeah, maybe uh, I mean, you can play us out with one more. I've got a lot of places to go, you know, so. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I want to talk about uh, the Patreon and, and uh, how the pandemic has changed the way you connect with your fans and, and your community. I mean, this is another lesson for marketers that that I look at all the time. Like, how do these how do these musicians, um, you know, not only um, stay in touch with their fans, but make them feel like they're part of something bigger, this community? And I think you do a really good job of that. I, I mean, I know you have a, a Patreon concert coming up uh that uh, Trish and I will certainly be, you know, front row for. And yeah, you guys are in my little gang there. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I, uh, I started it over the summer. So I've, I've done, I've done a fair amount of crowdfunding. Um, I've done Kickstarter. I've done pledge music before they went kaput. And um, I, I always was sort of very hesitant about it. Like, cause I feel like I, unfortunately, like, and again, uh, you know, I'm sort of jealous uh that like, you know, of, of the younger generation, like I sort of was, I, I'm the tail end of Gen X. I'm like an elder millennial or like a, a super young Gen Xer. So I have a foot in the old model and that's how I came up. So I came up with this idea that the goal was to connect through monoculture and then the echo of your connection in monoculture was going to then create the career, right? Even if you had one exposure point. And it is true, like even in my case where I released one song in England, all the ricochets of that one event have, have created a lot of opportunities for me as I've gone forward. I mean, I'm not going to lie, the, the record that I put out in 2008, or actually was supposed to come out, it came out in 2010, but the, or whatever it was, like the major label record that I, is the record that the, um, the ad executive from Aldi fell in love with, right? And so that's what got me in the door right? Because he knew that song and it's a UK company. Like if that never, you know, if you trace it back, but the ability to sustain myself and what's sort of happened is like, I've, you know, how the internet has kind of completely just torn apart and revolutionized distribution and created all these niche audiences. It's a completely different philosophy. And it took me really until the beginning of the pandemic to fully embrace it because I had a necessity because half my income was from live performance and that all went away in two days. So I had to figure something out. And what's really important, and I'm, I think marketers understand this intrinsically, but for musicians, it's always, what you're trying to monetize, it's not a product, it's a, it's a, it's a relationship. It's an experience, right? That's what you're monetizing. You're not monetizing a product. I think people get so hung up in this idea that the product has to be at a level that is like, it blows people away. And it does, but so much of what determines what blows people away is the sort of cultural endorsement and relevance that you get. You're on television, you're on the radio, someone thinks it's cool, they write about it, whatever it is. In reality, there's all kinds of cultural currency that exists, and sometimes they exist in very small pockets. I mean, and I've seen this time and time and again, like, my dear friend, this guy Cecil Baldwin, who's a host of this niche podcast called Welcome to Night Vale, they exploded through Tumblr. Like randomness, you know, they just, these cult communities pop up around content that they love. So you want to look as a marketer to make the bar to entry to your content as low as possible and make it as sticky as possible. And the biggest currency that you have outside of a hit, which you can never control, is you right? It's your time. It's their exposure to you. It's them feeling that you're personally connected to all the content that you're putting out. And that's the thing that s something like Patreon is attempting to monetize. That's what they're, that's what they're there for, to set up a paywall for basically, hey, the content you would blast out on social media for free, put it behind the paywall. And as long as you set the relationship and the expectation with, the, with your, your listener, your buyer, your fan, whatever it is, they're, because they, they want to give you the money. They want to give it to you. They want to support you. And I think, yes, that's a little trickier when you have a product, right? When the product has to have value. But like, I just bought a Peloton bike. Don't even ask me why. I did it. My, makes my, it's hopefully going to not be a coat rack. Can I afford it? Absolutely <laughs> not. These people, it's like a cult. They show up in branded Peloton. Like already, the, like that's something that's so intrinsically built into their marketing scheme. They're showing up in brand, like these two women showed up in fully branded Peloton outfits. It's not some movers and they install the bike like they're my friends, you know? I've never met these people before and they're already introducing me into their whole way of doing things. Now, I find that a bit creepy, 
but the, <laughs> the, 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 the concept is correct, right? My user experience has already begun. I feel like I know them. Oh, this is my friend Elizabeth who dropped my Peloton bike off. I, of course I know who she is, you know? And I do think it gets really divisive when it gets into pure capitalism. And as an artist, I have the luxury because I don't need to support a company. I just got to support me that I can kind of have more freedom. And I, but you know, it's a totally different animal when you're dealing with, you know, a bit like obviously the, the, that, the power, but the power of that and the principle is consistent. And that's the thing as a musician that I'm trying to embrace more of and trying to advocate for more of my kind to embrace. But uh, everybody, you know, no, everyone wants to be cool. And like, there's no more cool anymore. <laughs> Don't be cool. Just like be, the Peloton be, be open people. and have conversations. The Peloton, Peloton Dude, uh, folks up. are no, they're they're coming to my house uh, literally next weekend. So uh, I'm gonna get I, this. Jason, they're gonna. Sh it's like a cult, man. They're gonna show up like like the freaking Branch Davidians, ready to recruit you. I'm telling you, it's it's like you're like, what's going on here? What are you doing in my house with the bike? The bike looks cool though. Bike looks real cool. <laughs> I imagine the Sunshine Cleaning Company is that what on Seinfeld where they where George they they <laughs> they try to get everybody into the cult except for George and he's like totally. why am I not good enough? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. I felt like George with them dropping my bike off. I'm like, this isn't for me. It's for my wife. Um, Jill, I got one more question for you. I know we're running late, uh, but I got one, one more question for you. Uh, Active campaign. We always uh, talk about creating wow, um, and we define that sure. as uh, putting the customer first and 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 over delivering in value in everything we do. And I wonder what, what's your, what's your, uh, your secret for creating wow for your fans? Uh, because I, uh, in that at Patreon, you have some very uh, devoted fans. Yeah. I mean, it's small, but it's growing. And I, I, but I have a hunch that it's going to grow more as I go. You know, I have a good feeling about it. It's, it's always tough. You know, it's a big ask, like, especially for that to get someone to subscribe to you, you know, like, but, and, and, you know, clearly like the way automated marketing works, it's like, you know, the idea is that you're playing a numbers game, right? It's like Amazon's everywhere. So eventually you're going to have to use it, you know, and that's their, that's their game. And they're, if they're like, if we can get 3% of the business of the world, that's a huge amount of money. Whereas for an artist, you have, it's, you have to be more mindful of the relationship. It's more like at a premium. Like you can't just be, you know, you're, no one needs you. Like, like you're, you're, you're constantly in this place of essentially educating your audience to the, your value, right? And I think that's a big part of it is that it's clear communication with the person saying, this is what you're going to get. And then you, if you over deliver, it, it seems wonderful. I think, I think where, where artists fail is when they just sort of have an expectation that they're above it and, and they're not they're the, It's like, I do treat it like a product, you know, I say, Hey, you give me this, you're going to get this. And the, the wow component, I think really is just, it's just giving people access, you know, and, and being, being open. And it's, and I think in a weird way, and it's very antithetical, especially with art is to like allow them into the mess ups, you know, and part, part of what I'm trying to do is create sticky, cool concepts. Uh, you know, one of which I'm actually, I'm like starting a TikTok next week. I mean, Lord Jesus, like Lord help me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have a really good idea for it. It's like, you need to find a way to interface. That's like, people want to see the humanity. They want to see the imperfection. And if you can find a way to let, it's like, if, if they know that that's coming, like it doesn't need to, the wow isn't the greatness, right? The wow is more just giving it to them and giving it to them in a regular fashion. That's not overwhelming, you know, for me. Um, it's not like, look at what I can do. It's just about me. I mean, you know, and, and, and I, I had a stint managing YouTubers and I saw it firsthand. I mean, like, what do they do? Lord knows, you know, but <laughs> their fans love them, love them. And, and they'll, you know, they, they'll love them. They'll watch them talk about their favorite shoe they just bought. I mean, we're at build a bear or whatever, you know, it's, I think that's, um, that's an important thing. So for me, the wow is really about setting the expectation from the client and delivering and over delivering on time. Love it. Uh, Ernie, um, any any other questions you got for Julian while we have him? Uh, I'm just wondering if we could get a, another song here to to play us out. That's really all I've got left. Yeah, Julian. Hey, okay. thank you again for uh, for coming on, man. This has been really insightful. Uh, and no uh, what, do you, what do you got for us? Um, I'm glad I didn't scare you guys off. Uh, what am I? What do I have for you? Uh, what's a good story song we can do here? It doesn't require a ton of background information. Um, here is a fun one. I'll do a song I wrote about 
uh, not knowing how to drive a car. I live in. I'm, I have a learner's permit now, but I'm 41 years old. I still don't know how to drive a car. And this song is my argument for that. Take it away. Battery pack, I'm on my way to Union Square. I don't need much, a pair of shoes will get me there. Stop at a Peking Duck for lunch in Chinatown. Shop at a watch along Canal Mines. Slowing down, but I've been on time ever since I was 16. I've never been late, cause I've never had to wait for the lights to turn from red to green. What does horsepower even mean? I don't know how to drive. Who, who the hell wants a car anyway? I'm my feet on the street. I'm alive. I'm looking at you stuck sitting in traffic for an hour or two. The back of a cabby's head Blocking the view That's not what New Yorkers do Bumper to bumper It's St. Patrick's Day Parade Plaza Hotel's my shortcut Though I've never stayed Meet me at 3.15 Outside the Guggenheim Later for dinner And a little night music I love sun time And I've been walking tall Ever since I was See, that's the wrong button That's how it goes, right? And I've been walking tall Ever since I was 16, I've never missed a date Cause I've never had to wait for the lights to turn from red to green I'm my own two-legged machine I don't know how to drive Who the hell wants a car anyway? I'm my feet on the street, I'm alive I'm looking at you stuck sitting in traffic for an hour or two, the back of a cabby's head, blocking the view, that's not what New Yorkers do. Out in the Hamptons, everyone owns a Cadillac. Models with DUIs and a taste for arm and yak. Why would I need a wheel if I want to feel like I'm going places? I'll take a few bases. I don't know how to drive. Who the hell wants a car anyway? On my feet on the street, I'm alive. I'm looking at you stuck sitting in traffic for an hour or two. The back of a cabby's head blocking the view. When will you wake up and see the only way through? Is out here on the sidewalk, cause walking's what true New Yorkers do. Well done, Julian Villar. Thank you for playing us out. Uh, Julian, uh, where can they find you? Where can they connect with you? .com slash Julian Villard. Um, I'll say that again because I, I, I mistakenly I, pulled you out of the... <laughs> it's it's fine. I'm The wonders of live performance, I'm already like... A, you know, I'm hitting wrong buttons too. There's too many buttons in our world. Too <laughs> many buttons. But yeah. You can find me at Julian Villard on all the socials, probably at Julian Villard as of next week on TikTok. Lord, help me. Um, and uh, you can go to my Patreon, patreon.com slash Julian Villard. If you want to get involved, it's $2.50 a month. And I post weekly content uh, up there, podcasts, live videos, live streams, production live streams. And I've got new music coming out this year. You know, I'm everywhere if you want to find me. And if you also want to ignore me, I'm very easy to block too. The album is uh, Please Don't Make Me Play Piano Man. Congrats on the success. I can't imagine what you went through putting that together. Uh, thank you for uh, being a guest on the, the deluxe edition of the show, running almost an hour. We usually go a half hour, but uh, I was feeling it. Ernie, you doing good? You feeling it? Uh, yeah, this, this was fantastic. Julian, thank you very much. We uh, appreciate the, the tunes, the insight. It was fantastic. And, awesome. oh, I almost you're, forgot you're... some. I'm not going to say it. You're a very I almost forgot to young say, man, Ernie. You are a very impressive young man, Ernie. Uh, I almost forgot to say we have some uh, some limited edition active campaign live swag, Ernie. I didn't even tell you about this. It just came over the airwaves. 
Uh, but we will be uh, giving away swag to uh, our favorite comments of the show. So uh, we'll reach out to you. Stay tuned. Comment more. Uh, we'll be back next week with uh, Karina Cunningham. Uh, she's a digital marketing uh, story nerd and digital marketer extraordinary here in the UK, uh, talking about entertainment marketing uh, and how to uh, entertain your crowd and pull them into the funnel and uh, make them a happy customer. Create that wow moment. Julian Villard, thanks so much, my friend. Uh, well, I'll see you this Saturday at the big concert in the Patreon, right? That's right. I'll see you behind the paywall, my friend, where all the fun happens. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Everyone, Ernie, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Julian, thanks again. Killer setup. Uh, we'll see you all next week. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, LinkedIn Live, Active Campaign, signing off. Cheers. <laughs>